Welcome to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld, and this program is about the evolution of our consciousness and how we as a culture are moving to a new place collectively. And that's why I'm so happy to have back with me on my show Deepak Chopra, and his latest book is called The 13th Disciple. You've written a quite yeah. a amazing spiritual adventure here. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of a cross between the Celestine Prophecies and A Wrinkle in Time. Mm -hmm. And the whole theme of this is it's a, it's a fiction, The 13th Disciple is a fiction, where people are evolving towards the light. They're evolving towards their own soul destiny. So, and people in this book are guided. Did you feel guided in writing this book to a population that needs that awareness? Yeah, to some extent, yeah, I did feel guided, yes. Well, talk about the inspiration behind this book. Well, I've been intrigued by the phrase, I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth, in the Gospel of John. Yeah. I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth. Now, what's important out there mm -hmm. are the first two words, I am. I am. Okay. Right. So, if I say, I'm having an interview with um, Alan Steinfeld, mm -hmm. I'm watching these uh, beautiful roses, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the movie tonight, mm -hmm. I'm in love, I loved my dinner mm -hmm. uh, at the Chinese restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to going to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Those two words are always in every experience. I am. I am. Mm -hmm. The experience is time-bound. Mm -hmm. The interview with Alan mm -hmm. is going to be over soon. I hope not too soon. <laughs> yeah, but it's in time. Yeah. It I'm looking at the roses as an experience in time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Vancouver as an experience in time. So all experience is in time. Mm -hmm. But I am is not in time. Mm. So. Yeah. So when you look at the Old Testament and, you know, Moses asked the burning bush, God, what's your name? Mm -hmm. He says, I am. I am that I am. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. So I am is the fundamental consciousness that imbues every experience. I am the way. Yes, you can't have an experience without I am. Mm -hmm. I am the truth. You can't have an experience without, you can't seek the truth without I am. I am the life. I am is the life force inside you, which we call spirit. So I am is fundamental consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's the light of awareness. In, in the, the other Gospels, Jesus says, um, you are the light of the world. Now, by light of the world, it doesn't mean these photons. Photons have no color. Mm -hmm. Photons have no dimensionality. But the light of awareness converts photons into this three-dimensional mm -hmm. reality which is evolving in time. So the problem people have had when they, Jesus said, I am the light, the truth, and the way, they thought they were talking about Jesus, the personality. But the, there is no such thing as a fixed personality. Right, anyway, so he was really begin. talking about this uh, non-local consciousness. Uh, yeah, actually in Aramaic, I stands for, um, in, uh, the, the, if you tr go to the original mm -hmm. Aramaic language, which mm -hmm. supposedly he talked in, mm -hmm. spoken, yeah. I is ena ena, the I within the I, mm -hmm. the spirit within the ego. Okay, so Deepak Chopra is an assumed personality. Alan Steinfeld is an assumed personality. Yeah. What is assuming that personality is I. It's the spirit. It's that spirit that, and so. But I, I prefer even to the word spirit, the light of consciousness. Why? Because it makes the world manifest. It makes the invisible visible. Mm. The fundamental nature of reality is that it's, it's nothing. When you go beyond the appearance of molecules, mm -hmm. You enter a subatomic cloud, you go beyond the cloud, there's nothing there. So is the nothing just a void or is it the light of awareness that brings the world into manifestation? I agree. And we're doing that right now. In every act of perception, mm -hmm. you convert the invisible into the visible. 
I agree. And so people who know, who have transcended their personality and know they're more than their body, are awakening to the light of consciousness. And we're now in a transitional period, like the characters in this book, where they're going from the dogma of scientism that says, no, don't believe your experience, believe what we tell you, to saying that maybe there's something more. For instance, I teach these women on the Upper East Side. I teach them a class on spirituality. And they've had incredible experiences. One woman dreamed of her dead husband. She said it was so real. And then she says, I can't believe this. And she got depressed. And I'm saying, no, you can believe it, but don't believe the dogma of scientism. So talk about this crossroad we're at in a general population where people are waking up all the time and yet science has such a hold on their minds that they don't allow them to accept their own experience. Well, science is very useful mm -hmm. for creating technology. If we didn't have science, people wouldn't be able to watch this conversation, right? right? I mean, scientism, yeah. it's religion. Science is also useful for everything that we do every day. I right. took a jet plane to get to New York. Right. Uh, we use the internet, etc. So science deals with specific laws of nature which are called regularities of nature. Because they're regular, we can study them. Mm -hmm. And then once we study them, we get an insight into how these laws of nature work, which then help us allow, they allow us to they, they may make it easy for us to organize our experience mm -hmm. of life, organize our experience and also manipulate our experience, control our experience. Mm -hmm. So science is very useful in controlling what we call perceptual experience of life. Mm -hmm. But perceptual experience is not fundamental reality. The fundamental truth. reality is that which makes perceptual experience possible. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the ancient uh, Vedic literature, it says that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no seeing. That which cannot be heard, but without which there is no hearing. That which cannot be perceived, conceived, imagined, mm -hmm. conceptualized, even thought, but without which there would be no thought, no conception, no imagination, mm -hmm. no creativity. What is that? That is the light of consciousness. That is who we are that in is our who we essence. Are. Yes. And that's who we've always been. And that's what also makes science possible, because science is an activity in consciousness. Science is based on experiments, observations, and mm -hmm. theories. Where are theories conceived in consciousness? Mm -hmm. Where are experiments designed in consciousness? Mm -hmm. Where are observations made mm -hmm. in consciousness? Max Planck said, you cannot get behind consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere, he said, mind is the matrix of matter. Hans-Peter Dewar, who was the recent uh, director of the Max Planck Institute, he said, matter is not made of matter. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the most fundamental levels mm -hmm. of the universe, what we call physical things are more mind-like than matter-like. Right. I, I, and I, behind I, that is, of course, the consciousness that is conceiving, constructing, governing, and becoming the world of physical objects. And that's where we are in this moment as we're moving into a, a, a really a new reality. Some so, people, some so, people. So let's talk about that. Well, um, the six characters in the book yeah. represent those different attitudes. Mm -hmm. So you have in the book, you have a militant atheist, right? Right. right. That's he Galen. doesn't believe anything. Okay, he doesn't believe anything, only his perceptual experience. Right. And perceptual experience is what we call naive realism, mm -hmm. that the world is as it looks to be. This is all that this exists. This is all that is when we know that this is a construct that is is basically a human construct mm -hmm. through a human nervous system. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's we've discussed that you. before. Okay. Yes. That's one aspect of consciousness, yeah, of consciousness. Of the limited consciousness. Then you have another character here, Jimmy, mm -hmm. who basically, you know, he was brought up in a religious Catholic family, he just believes what he was told. Mm -hmm. So he's a fundamentalist. And he represents all fundamentalists, right. uh, you know, who were in a way brainwashed into some dead white guy over there. <laughs> okay, so that's another attitude that people yeah, another have. Another limited attitude, limited. exactly. And then you have, uh, you know, you start seeing the opening here. The third character, the male character here, uh, is Frank. Frank. He's yeah. an agnostic. He says, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going on. 
But then the women, that's why it's called the 13 disciples, because it's looking mm. at the feminine aspect of the divine, which is there in the New Testament. The entire uh, Sermon on the Mount is, in a way, all the feminine mm -hmm. aspects of the divine. With who, Mary? No, no, forget the characters. There's a state of consciousness. Oh. Okay, so it's, it's the entire Sermon on the Mount is about beauty, intuition, nurturing, forgiveness, love, uh -huh. compassion, joy, equanimity, mm -hmm. the, the, the aspects that we relate to the feminine archetypes. Mm -hmm. So in this book, we have three characters, okay? Mm -hmm. You have Mer, the seeker, you have Lilith, who is kind of already into mysticism because she's having experiences, right. and then you finally have Meg, who's gone into the light. Mm -hmm. So you see the entire range of attitudes that are present today. How did a nice Hindu guy like you get so into Christianity? I was brought up by Irish Christian oh. missionaries, and so at home I was a Hindu, and school I was a Catholic uh, <laughs> student. Yes. You were. And then, you know, your own transition, and we don't have to go talk about too much personal stuff because I know, but you went from someone who was not open to this stuff, and your daughter talks about how you you know, we were smoking, you were drinking, and then you had an awakening that we are all now coming into. I think the moment you go from what you're looking at to who's looking, you start to have How that awakening. How did you do that? How did you go from someone, I guess, tr meditation? Meditation was a beginning, but I'm not, uh, right now, I'm always aware yeah. that I bring I am into every experience. Um, and as long as I'm focused on the I am, mm -hmm. in the midst of I am this, or I am that, or I'm enjoying this mm -hmm. or that, then I'm never overshadowed by the experience. Mm -hmm. So you, The experience, as I said, is not who you are. You're the one who's manufacturing the experience, mm -hmm. you're living the experience, and the experience is subsiding as memory into the I am. In the end, there's no only I am, and if you go deep enough into the I am, it is the Akashic field. It's the immeasurable potential of all that was, all that is, and all that will ever be. And that's where we want to go. That's so why have to conversation? Why? Because that's, all, I mean, what is the reason for this material world? I mean, it exists because we're here to play it's in, the I am, in the I am that. It's in a way entertainment. Sometimes the entertainment gets very horrific, though. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, it becomes a nightmare. <laughs> uh, instead of being uh, a nice movie, it becomes a horror movie. And that depends on the state of our collective consciousness mm -hmm. and how it's bubbling out at that moment in space and time. You have the Holocaust, you have ISIS, mm -hmm. you have all these but, but other but with all very that gruesome, yeah. you know, uh, projections of um, the conditioned mind. But with all that, something else is awakening on the planet. There's a quickening of vibration, and we are all having experiences. We're all being led. I'm thinking that's probably true, yeah. Well, I've had those experiences yes. where I felt like I was more than my body. I felt I was vibrating at a quicker yeah, rate. Your body is one of the projections of your core consciousness. And so... In this book that you write, these people have these visions, and these visions are here to wake up other people. Yeah. Uh, what can you share about maybe some of your experiences? See, without getting esoteric, yeah. every thought that you have and every emotion that you have, mm -hmm. you, what do you call it? Mind, okay? Yeah. Every sensation you have here, what do you call it? The body. Uh, yeah. Every sense perception you have, what do you call it? The world. Mm -hmm. So, in reality, all we have is sensations, images, mm -hmm. feelings, thoughts, and sense perceptions. Mm -hmm. And these are qualities of I am. These are qualities of fundamental light of awareness mm -hmm. that we then conceptualize right. as mind, body, and universe, and even the concept arises there. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you for that. And, so then when I go out in the world, I say, look at um, Spice Market. Well, that's my projection. I look at my own body. That's my projection. Mm -hmm. I look at my mind, your mind. It's a projection. Well, let's go to that point in the book where you say, and it's the Einstein quote, either everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. 
Well, I would say everything is a miracle. The fact that we exist is so astonishing that if we are not living life totally astonished all the time and not sharing our astonishment with each other, mm -hmm. then our humanity is incomplete. And, and what do you say for people who aren't living, who are maybe starving, who may be having a difficult time? Their life is still astonishing, but they're not seeing it. That is where love, compassion, empathy, and uh, service come in because that is, it is the responsibility of those who are actually um, in that state of awareness. It's their responsibility to help people to move into that state of awareness. You know, and this is your 80-something book and you've been doing this and you've decided to take a different approach by writing a novel. What, and it's very creative. It's my twelfth novel, though. But it's I, very, I but it's it's different. I've read some of your other novels, yes. and this is a has a creative spark that you've allowed yourself to. I feel but those two more. phrases. Yeah. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. Yes. You are the light of the world. If you understand those two two sentences, mm -hmm. that's the basis of the book. Right, and you go through characters, but you, you, I'm just getting about the writing part. You write the science books and you write these books. Is one book type of book preference over another? They have different audiences. My next book is called Super Genes with Rudy Tanzi, who's a Harvard geneticist and neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. I wrote Super Brain with him, and we are re-looking, revisiting everything we know about biology as an extension of our expression of consciousness. So we're looking at epigenetics, mm -hmm. Uh, genomics, we're looking at the microbiome, we're looking at the relationship of genetic behavior mm -hmm. to what happens in consciousness. And I'm fortunate that I have a mainstream scientist who wants to collaborate on that project. So let's combine that with some of the theme in this book, which is inner guidance. You know, is there a biology? Because when you get an inner guidance, you're actually getting some signal from the physiology. How would you combine? That. Every state of yeah. consciousness creates its own biology. So mm -hmm. if you're very simple about it, yeah. if somebody is scared, their biology is representing that feeling, right? Yeah. Yeah. They have high levels of adrenaline, mm -hmm. cortisol, their immune system is right. compromised, etc. If st somebody is in love, they have a different biology. Mm -hmm. But as we go into higher states of consciousness, right. what are called soul consciousness, divine consciousness, unity consciousness, cosmic consciousness, each of these states creates its own biology. The brain functions in a different way. Therefore, knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. Perception is different in different states of consciousness. Cognition is different in, di in different states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Reality is different in different states of consciousness. Well, yeah, I agree. And I think there's parts of our brain that we as a species are just tapping into that's activating a new perception and new states of consciousness. The brain is like an instrument mm -hmm. for observation. So, you know, you can uh, modulate. The brain itself is a modulation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you shift in consciousness, the expression of the world that you experience changes because you're modulating the instrument. If I had a nice mm -hmm. instrument that I could turn into a microscope or a telescope or even what might be called an ultra stroboscopic uh, nanoscope that can look into deep space, then I would be experiencing different things because my brain is just a mediator, a lens through which my non-local consciousness becomes local. Right, and as that non-local consciousness starts to activate more, the perception gets wider, more expansive. And William Blake said, uh, if the doors of perception were cleansed, yes. everything would appear as it is, infinite. But do you think just that that's happening more and more collectively? I do, that more people are having these expanded states and that's changing the fabric of our culture. It's definitely part of our collective conversation right now. Something sure. else is happening. Yeah, I what, think so. What do you notice? You travel the world, people come up to I you. I notice that you? people are more receptive. And uh -huh. so I'm very careful in what I say. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't say things to mm -hmm. people who are not ready for uh, to listen to what I'm saying. So I'm very careful in what I say, depending on the audience. Well, and I'm also very careful to frame it in the understanding of science that I have. 
Right, I know that, but you've also written a book about mystical experience and mystics, and you know you can't deny the fact that you are a mystic. I mean, I don't want to tell if your scientific friend. If mystic, we mean that we can go beyond the borders of ordinary perceptual mm -hmm. experience, beyond waking, dreaming, and sleeping, then yes. Well, you are, and and uh, you know I think that these experiences that you outline here are open to people. Yes, and that's the magic of people. Because what do you want people to get? They pick up this book, they see these people having these amazing revelations. What would you like people to get? I think this book is meant for those who are already, in a sense, having the experiences. Yes. If somebody has never had an experience out of the ordinary, mm. out of the hypnosis of social conditioning, the book won't do much for them. But if they have had any experience that they would consider not ordinary or miraculous or mystical, then the book might actually expand their consciousness. Well, that's it. Bec and you've had to also have been in an expanded state to even tap into that. Where do you get those ideas? You talk about the uh, mystery schools here. I've been to the mystery schools. Well, this is the mystery school right now. Once you get to your core consciousness and you recognize that there could be no thought, no perception, no idea, no conception, no imagination, no creativity, in other words, no reality without that, then that's the biggest miracle of life. Yeah, well, let's just talk to those people. They're stuck in their drama. They're stuck in their pain body as Eckhart Tolle. What do you say to people? You can't say, well, I am consciousness. Get over your, your drama. We have to talk to those people as well. Everybody is doing the best they can from the level of awareness they're in. And sometimes you have to go through the suffering in order to have a little bit of insight or what people would call awakening. There are three ways that people awaken. Some because they have suffered intensely mm -hmm. and they've reached rock bottom and somehow they encounter fundamental reality. Mm -hmm. The second is they were brought up that way. In a sense, I was brought up that way. So I don't have to go through all the... Mm -hmm stuff that people have to go through. And the third is... But you did go through some stuff. Yeah, but temporary. Yeah, okay. you know, because I was, I was brought up that way. And the third is as people get older and engage in their, suddenly become aware of their mortality, mm -hmm. then they get uh, interested. So uh, those are three common ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, crisis, yeah. already brought up in the way, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, getting old and encountering the fact that death is stalking you. Mm -hmm. Every time you look behind, the prince of death is closer. We're on death row. The only uncertainty is the method of execution and the length <laughs> of reprieve. So they say, what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. And they have that awakening. Because I am is not subject to death, mm. right? I am this, I am that, I am having that experience is time bound and therefore is born and dies. Mm. But I am is never born and therefore cannot die. Bhagavad Gita says, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, fire cannot burn it. It's unborn, it's not subject to death. That's the whole goal of what spiritual traditions call enlightenment. Right. I was going to ask you that people want a mystical experience, but you're saying the I am is that when you realize the I am, you've had a mystical experience. That's all that's necessary. And there's phantasm, fantastic events. This is a phantasm. All right, but don't you want beings to appear in front of us and lead us into the other dimension? If you want, you can, you know, just rec recognize yeah. you can have any illusion that you want. <clears throat> if you are interested in illusions. There's illusion and delusion. No, no, but all these beings that you're talking mm -hmm. about, all the angels that you're talking about, they're as much an illusion as this is. Mm -hmm. I okay? agree. I agree, yeah. So why create a hierarchy of illusions? Right. The I, it keeps going back to this I am. Once you get in touch with that part of yourself, uh, there's no fear of death. There is uh, transcendence from ordinary reality. And there's the awakening of platonic truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And I'm happy with that. I don't need more illusions. Was there a moment, though, where you said, 
I'm not that, I, I am. I, was there a moment in your life that you had that awakening? They say it takes a long time for a fruit to ripen, and then one day it falls. And <laughs> so in my case, I think uh, there were many such moments. But for me, there was one moment where I said, oh, I'm not that. It was a moment of mystical experience where the, the atmosphere changed and I realized that I wasn't my personality and I wasn't my body, that I was this other thing. And so we're here to encourage those. I was just wondering if you wanted to share that moment or your series of moments, the first moment where maybe it was in meditation or... Yeah, I have those moments in meditation. I have those moments actually as I walk around the streets. Mm -hmm. And I have those moments when I'm downloading a book. You're downloading. You feel like this, the books are coming to you. For the moment, yeah. When they stop, I'll stop. <laughs> so you're just saying basically the only thing that people need to experience is their I am consciousness. Their fundamental consciousness, yes. Because, um, you know, there are levels of reality and the most lev most fundamental ground of your being is the ground of all being. So there's a phrase again in Eastern wisdom traditions, Atman is Brahman. Mm -hmm. The core of your being is manifesting this universe. But you know, when you get in touch with this core or this light or your soul essence, you, think, you start to see the light in people. You start then you can upgrade the illusions, yes. You upgrade the illusion. That's it. To what? To whatever you want. I mean, heaven is so-called the upgrading of the, of, of the illusion. Hell is downgrading the illusion. This is purgatory as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. I think this is heaven. I it all it. depends on where you look, what you're using to look at right. the world with. Is there a different part of your brain that switches on when you're doing a, non, a fiction versus Probably. non-fiction? But you're just having fun. Yeah. What's your feeling about living in the... Do you, are you... Grateful? I'll, I don't want to... Grateful, astonished, and humble. Mm. Thank you, Deepak Thank Chopra, you. for being here. Thank you. This is his latest book called The Thirteenth Disciple. It is a novel about waking up, attaining a higher level of spirituality, and living in the light. What's, your, what's the great line in it? I am the way, I am the life, and I am the truth. It's from the Gospel of John in the New Testament. This is Alan Steinfeld for New Realities. Thanks for watching. If you want to reach me, go to my website, newrealities.com, or your website, deepakchopra.com.